Okay, yeah, I'm gonna talk about supervisor memory protection keys, but we call them protection keys supervisor or PKS for short. That's the, uh, um, that's the name. Oh, okay, here's the next slide button. Sorry, I was <laughs> a little distracted there. Um, so quick outline, you know, why are we doing this? Um, we're gonna explain a little bit of the hardware overview first because that helps to go through some of the use cases and then we're going to uh, present a couple of use cases and then circle back to the core software and uh, close out with status next steps and acknowledgements. And I just like to say right from the get go, I had a slide in here about testing. So coming off of the previous talk, you know, um, I took the slide out, but <laughs> I kind of feel bad that I did because that last talk was so good. Um, but anyway, uh, we do have test case for this, uh, but we won't present it here. So, you know, why are we doing this? Um, uh, we have a couple of use cases, uh, specifically uh, persistent memory stray write protection uh, was one of the cases that was in the back of our minds when Intel developed the hardware for this. And subsequently, we've uh, found a couple of other good use cases. There's been um, a, a lot of different use cases batted around and discussed. Um, you know, IBM was even talking about some things uh, that they were looking at Mike, Mike Rappaport. Um, but right now we have two use cases that are, are in development, uh, the stray write protection, which we're submitting as part of the core patch set, and then the write protected page tables that Rick is going to present that he's been working on. We've also uh, submitted to the mailing list a uh, another use case for hardening sensitive data like kernel keys. We've kind of backed away from that use case. Uh, it's It's a little simpler. Um, but we were focusing on the first two. Um, so, you know, one of the things about these use cases is, you know, one might say, well, you know, why don't we just use the page tables, you know, specifically write protected page tables, you know, you can write protect things using the page tables themselves, but we're going to kind of get into that. So to give a little bit of background, uh, the PKS hardware, um, implements something very similar to uh, protection keys in user space. So uh, PowerPC and x86 AMD Intel support a user space uh, protection key mechanism and PKS extends that to um, supervisor page tables. So a protection key is added to each page table entry and there's a model specific register MSR uh, that is per thread that uh, defines the actual access allowed for each of those protection keys. The changes to the access are quote fast and I put fast in quotes because obviously writing to an MSR is not always the fastest thing. Um, but when you compare it to page table walks or having to flush TLBs um, and the fact that the MSR is non serializing. So it's actually a little faster than a normal MSR write, and the fact that this is a thread local mechanism, the changes to the access is a lot faster than updating traditional page table protections. So getting into the details, uh, you know, here we see a simple uh, uh, page table entry and, you know, we have the execute bit, we have a user and, and supervisor bit and a read write bit. Um, uh, PK, uh, PKS adds the protection key. It's four bits uh, that define the protection key um, in, in some unused bits. Um, it's available in four and five level page tables. So um, x86-64 is all that's implemented to support right now. And there's a per thread MSR that defines the actual permissions that are allowed for each of those 15 P keys that are allowed. Um, it is a 64-bit register, so we have some bits reserved. Um, right now, the hardware defines an access disable and a write disable bit for each of uh, 0 through 15 P keys. P key 0 is reserved as part of the default. These bits are defaulted to 0, so normal pages that exist in the kernel today will just pass through with full um, access. Um, so we use one of those P keys um, just for you know, what I'll call normal pages, and that leaves 15 P keys for users like um, our use cases that we're presenting here. 
uh, it's important to remember that this is a thread local register. So each, uh, each CPU has this register and changes to this register affect only the, the thread running on that CPU and not other threads. Um, this is very important um, for a number of reasons. It's both good and bad, as we'll get into later as we uh, explore the use cases that we had. Um, and it's not X save managed. Um, so as threads are swapped in and out, they need to, the MSR needs to be preserved in software. A final note about this is there is no execute from, from protections. Um, this protection is layered on top of the existing page table entry protections. And so, uh, but uh, execute is not one of the protections that is, that is um, layered on top. So you can do, at, you know, read, write, um, write only and full acts, um, uh, read, write, write only and access disable, which basically allows no access, but you cannot use um, like an execute permission bit. So the advantages um, are, of course, that this overlays additional protections on large pages of domain or on large domains of pages. And by that, I mean, you can, rather than twiddling the bits on a single PTE, and yes, PTEs can cover large pages of different various sizes all the way down to the 4K page. Um, however, by setting the same P key on a lot of PTE entries, you can change the protections on the large areas very quickly because you can do this MSR right relatively fast and that protection applies only to that thread and um, can be turned on and off very quickly for an entire domain. This, this really helped as we'll get into with my stray right protection use case and the, ch the changes are thread local. So the page table entry is constant in the P key or in the page, Page table entry P key is constant. Um, it stays the same and the protections available through the page table entry are, are uh, preserved. So as some people might see right, right away, uh, you know, there's this stray write protection. So the issue with persistent memory is that persistent memory and actually all memory is vulnerable to stray writes. Uh, persistent memory is mapped in the direct map um, but we really don't want just any old device writing into this memory. Um, but more importantly, a one of these stray writes could permanently corrupt user data. Um, so it take, for example, a file system that's that's created on top of a persistent memory area. You know, if you were to have a stray write write to some of the metadata of that file system, the file system could become permanently corrupt and corrupt a, a large swath of user data. This is really bad and we want to prevent that. Um, and changing page table entries is troublesome. Uh, you know, obviously we could, you know, very carefully map persistent memory with page tables in a way that we could potentially twiddle bits, you know, mapping large pages or some such thing. Uh, but that's going to be very troublesome. And PKS is fast. And like I said, we can map these large domains under a single protection key and, and twiddle the, the protections very quickly. So it turned out though, you know, that, that was kind of our general design idea when we did this, but it turned out that applying the PKS protections was really easy. So when we set up the page tables for persistent memory, it's very easy to just pick a P key, assign that P key to all the page table entries and we're off to the races. And we thought toggling protections was going to be easy as well because there's very few places where drivers actually need to have direct access. Um, but it turns out it was kind of hard. Um, get my button here. Um, so the default is that restrictions are no reads and writes, which basically prevents any stray write, any random driver from, from writing to our memory through the, through the direct map. Um, and it works well for the, the default PKS permissions for the, the stray write. Um, direct access is limited. Um, and like I said, there was just a few drivers that needed access um, directly. And we thought that general kernel access being wrapped with KMAP would be very easy to add, to enhance the KMAP interface to twiddle the 
the PKS uh, protections on a, on a thread basis. And it turns out the KMAP didn't work out quite as well as we thought. Um, the big thing was the KMAP was not thread local. Um, like I said, I, I kind of stressed earlier that um, PKS, the MSR register, is a thread local register. So global updates became um, a difficult uh, thing to do. Initially, I tried to modify KMAP to uh, create a global uh, um, update across all threads, all MSRs, and uh, you know, did some things in the fault handler and some other things, and it just turned out to be really difficult. And it was brought up on the mailing list in discussions that if we do that, if we do have a K map that, that basically maps something globally, um, effectively we're kind of turning protections off. And, and a lot of drivers that do these types of K maps often leave that K map in place for a long time. So effectively we're kind of turning the protection off anyway, um, because everybody else is just gonna, you know, gonna have open, access and it was decided that it would be better um, to actually fix kmap and start to restrict the uses of kmap um, specifically uh, it was it was decided you know kmap was never really intended to be used that way and people that are using it, it it's kind of a violation of, of the semantics of kmap you know even though it's not technically wrong um, and obviously people have just sort of like it's evolved into being okay. Um, so initially I had a KMAP thread, um, which basically took KMAP instances that were thread local and basically turned them into, you know, kind of a well-known, we can support PKS. We know that we're only doing a thread local operation here. So the user can call this KMAP. It is technically a, a global mapping um, in my implementation, but um, it would do the PKS correctly. Um, that was kind of one step, but then uh, Thomas Gleichsner came, came along and said, you know, what we really want isn't what you're doing. What we really want is a KMAP local page. What we want is a preemptible thread local KMAP, which is what KMAP was really intended to be all along. And so he came along and wrote the KMAP local page patch set, which actually created a preemptible thread local mapping. And of course, that works great for me for PKS. So once that patch set landed, I was able to start to convert the users that I was really concerned about into the KMAP local page and drop my KMAP thread patch. Now, this all kind of drove the need for a relaxed mode because as we started to comb through the kernel and look at all the KMAP instances, um, we realize that, you know, there's still some people calling KMAP and, you know, we believe at this point with the current patch set that the users that are going to be using persistent memory aren't going to be calling KMAP. However, that said, um, it's possible that somebody will call KMAP. And so if they call KMAP, we needed a relaxed mode. And so we're going to discuss that a little bit, but we're going to segue first and let uh, Rick talk about his use case. Um, and that's going to feed back into that need for a relaxed mode. So go ahead, Rick. All right. Uh, so I think Ira, I don't have the ability to change slides. So I'm just going to, Oh, I oh, made oh. you a presenter just now. You should have the ability to change slides now. Oh yeah. I see it now. Thanks. Thank you. Um, So uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, another usage I've been exploring, which is this uh, write protected page tables concept. It's something that is still kind of being proved out and kind of just exploring it with these RFCs in public. Um, you know, it started out with, with uh, hardening in mind, uh, but other people brought up that it also could be useful for um, debugging as well, since corrupted page tables can be especially hard to debug, makes, very, makes for very strange stack traces. Um, the general idea, though, is that uh, to protect corruption of the page tables by making them uh, read only and only writable when they're on a perceived view basis when they're being modified. Unlike uh, PMEM, this uh, usage of PKS wants the PKS memory to have a default read only permission because we're only worried about the stray writes. So this required uh, Ira to do some work on the core series to support non uh, not disabled um, all, you know, default values so that when you have a, an interrupt or a new thread or something that automatically 
get set with the um, with, with what the default value will be. Um, and as Ira mentioned, uh, you know, toggling read write permissions with PKS memory is is easy and fast. Uh, and for page tables, the toggling of the PKS protections is is actually you know it is easy. Uh, there's just some page table helpers, and you, we just toggle them inside there. You can see on the slide some examples. Uh, but in sort of the opposite uh, opposite situation of uh, of uh, of uh, what Ira had to deal with for PMEM is that the toggling is easy. We don't have to deal with the KMAP stuff, but uh, applying the PK PKS protections is a little more complicated because the page tables are allocated uh, dynamically, unlike P PMEM, which is allocated at boot. So, uh, so PMEM, you know, uh, the usage of, will apply the protection, you know, when it maps, but, you know, the, the page tables are allocated dynamically at runtime, and these are just coming from the page allocator. There's not like a lot of rhyme or reason to where, where they're going to end up. Um, let's read the comments. Um, so, uh, you know, the problem with, uh, just sort of with, 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 um, applying the protections at runtime is that changing, changing the direct map is pretty expensive since the kernel address space is shared. Of course, you need a all CPU TLB shoot down and on x86, it also will break the direct map. Um, to um, small to down to small pages or whatever size is needed, and then that's never repaired. So you end up with uh, if you just you know the naive solution of just okay we allocate a page now apply PKS protections before we start using it um, is I, I didn't even try to implement that it just seemed like it would never work. Um, so uh, um, you know this is sort of and, and this a problem of of breaking the direct map for applying um, permissions on it is sort of a general uh, kernel memory permission problem. But for this usage, you know, for modules and stuff, there's not that many modules. Um, but uh, for page tables are allocated way, way more frequently. So it just would never work to just sort of start shattering the direct map uh, all the time, every time a page table gets allocated. Um, so yeah, so like I just said, it's not the first thing with this problem. Um, you know, there's some been some attempts to sort of work on it. Uh, personally, I've done a bunch of uh, little experiments around um, the other kernel memory permissions, mostly modules and BPF jets. And then there's also uh, this, you know, that those were all just uh, not, nothing ever made it upstream, but there's the secret mem feature, which has a, does a similar thing. It's not applying permissions exactly, but it's um, unmapping pages, which I guess is sort of a permission. Um, and uh, those, you know, these all sort of use a similar approach, uh, which is to sort of convert memory uh, in batch. So you sort of amortize the cost of the shoot down. Um, and then uh, you want to also um, convert memory in physically contiguous regions so that you don't have um, shattering of the pages all across the direct map. You sort of localize all the breakage. Uh, so uh, what we have so far um, in the PKS table series is just a simple, um, this group pages, group page cache thing, which, uh, has per node caches. Um, and when, you know, the mono page tables grow, it tries to allocate, uh, from two megabyte pages and then converts them to PKS and then starts using them and zeros them, of course. Um, and, uh, the other thing we've added is a shrinker so that, you know, you don't end up just with just a giant cache of page tables eventually if the amount of page tables in use shrinks you know the system can ask for them back and then we just reset them to their default permissions um, uh, before returning returning them to the page allocator uh, and it you know seems to work okay the one downside um, or one downside is that uh, we can't return you know today page tables when they're freed are just returned directly to the page allocator uh, instead of um, you know, and, but what we need to actually make sure we return them to this group group page cache thing because if we return permission pages to the page allocator, the next user is going to be unhappily surprised when they try to write to it. So a few extra, there's some extra logic in the page table handling code in the kernel to make sure we return it. Um, you know, if it's you know like in uh, swap, it has to say, well, if this is a page table, just make sure you return it to the page table place. Um, the other uh, sort of the other sort of uh, interesting problem, you know, complexity with this thing is that 
is handling the direct map page tables. So that's like the page tables that are mapping the direct map. Um, you know, if the kernel runs out of page tables, then it needs to convert some more to PKS, uh, which usually requires breaking a large page in the direct map, which would require a page table. But the problem is we don't have any. So we're kind of in a chicken and egg problem where we've ran out of page tables. And we can't make any more. Uh, so looking at this, um, you know, I looked at a couple options. Uh, one option would be to convert uh, a high order page and use it for the requested page and for the direct map split. Um, this would require a higher page to be available. So it regresses from the existing behavior a little bit. You can't get two pages, you know, scattered about and pull this, pull this off, uh, you know, sort of get a, a net profit of, PK, of uh, PKS protected page tables. Um, but it also leaves a window where the page table is unprotected right before it gets installed. So for the hardening usage, this is not uh, ideal. Um, now, a, a, a simple option would be just to map the direct map uh, at 4K at boot. Um, and this, uh, this avoids never ever needing to map the direct map or to, to break the direct map, which simplifies a lot of things. But mapping the direct map at 4K has uh, undesirable performance characteristics. So what we have for now is uh, something where it reserves, uh, reserves um, enough page tables at boot or at hot plug to, um, to, uh, to map the entire direct map at 4K and sort of sets them aside, pre-converts them to PKS, uh, and then um, uh, so then it um, can just, it, when you need to break the direct map, it can never fail. It always has a PKS table on hand to, um, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, um, set the, to, to break the direct map. And the, you know, the downside is that it has the same memory overhead as mapping the direct map at 4K, um, but at least you don't have to have, you know, you don't have to take the TLB um, page walking performance hits. So I'm kind of, this is the current solution. So I think maybe there's some better way where we can have it all, um, but I haven't, um, uh, I haven't um, figured out anything better yet. So that's what we have for now. And then um, I think next is back to Ira. Okay, let me give you a presentation link. Okay. Yeah, so. Obviously, I was pretty focused initially in the core software on my use case of uh, the stray right protection. Um, Rick's use case coming online really helped to kind of redefine some of the core software support. Um, specifically, we mentioned the uh, the default values that are required. Uh, obviously, stray right um, fit in very nicely with the defaults um, for all of the keys, which is no protection or which is uh, no access. And, um, you know, that worked great. And it seemed like having a dynamic key allocator would be nice uh, because we're just allocating keys, um, you know, that are unused. Uh, but it turned out, again, because of that global update uh, difficulty, allocating a new key dynamically on the fly for, say, a driver or for this, you know, new page table use case. Um, was going to be kind of difficult because we would want to get the default to be read only and not access disable. And after going through a number of iterations and trying different things and trying to basically update, um, you know, all current users, uh, we, we just abandoned the uh, dynamic allocator. Um, since we only have two use cases and kind of a third in the wings, um, you know, and we have 15 keys, static key allocation just seemed like a, a better way to go at, at this time. Um, we don't really anticipate that the numbers of users are going to grow a lot. And the other thing is that even if the number of users grew, they, the sharing of a single key would have to be kind of worked out. And that probably would need to be worked out, you know, as the software was being designed rather than something that could be done dynamically. So real quick on the on the right side, a, a little bit of use of how you use this interface. Um, 
we, uh, you know, we have an enum that, that defines all the consumers for PQs, you know, and in this case, I've got my feature and, you know, I can add the default value for my feature. As we can see, the default key, which is key zero, is, is basically a complete read, um, read and write access. Um, my feature has a disable write feature, um, you know, and there's an access disable default as well. So another thing that uh, is very obvious from, from the thread local and XSAVE not being supported is the fact that threads and exceptions need to have um, the MSR cached away uh, as uh, uh, things are scheduled in, scheduled out, accepted, interrupted. Um, so initially we knew right away we were going to have to do this for, for threads. Um, so we added a cached MSR to the thread struct. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that we did do some optimizations in the software to not update the MSR if we don't need. So if a thread is, is scheduled in and the MSR hasn't changed, um, it can it can just continue running without updating the MSR. So the overhead there is is pretty quick. Um, initially, we just skipped exception save support. Um, it was kind of decided that, especially for stray write use case, um, you know, having uh, little windows where an exception would have access um, if it accepted a um, a critical section of um, the persistent memory users that it would be fine for that exception to be able to have access. Um, but as uh, Rick's use case came online and other use cases like the potential to try to protect, um, you know, any kernel secrets, um, we started to say, you know what, we really should support exception save support. And with exception save support, um, we initially um, looked at uh, using um, the IRQ save structure uh, and, it, you know, when we decided to go ahead and, and add exception save support, it looked like the, the RQ um, save structure was going to be pretty easy. We could just kind of cache the MSR there and, uh, you know, recursively, if an exception got accepted, we can just kind of update that, that, um, that cache value and, you know, kind of recurse down and it wasn't really going to be that hard to do. Um, but a lot of people didn't like that. The patches were uh, pretty complex. We had to add that structure to be passed around to various places to make sure that, you know, anybody that needed that MSR value um, could, could have access to it. And eventually, uh, Andy Lutromirsky, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, came up with a clever little idea to, you know, throw a little extra stack space in um, kind of in a, you know, extra stack space that's not there and extend the PT register structure. So, you know, it was batted around to add this to the PT reg structure, but the PT reg structure is, is somewhat public where people need that structure to be well-defined for things like BPF. And so we really didn't want to touch the PT reg structure. Um, so, but Andy's idea was to just throw a little bit of stack space in there and extend that register so that we can get to that pointer only if we need to. And that was really clever. Uh, and I like the idea, but, you know, coming from, you know, a driver rider standpoint, and I haven't worked on assembly code in probably 20 years, and when I did, it was PowerPC assembly, you know, opening up the, the, the entry code and looking in there on those files, it was pretty daunting for me. Uh, but, you know, I dug in and asked a lot of questions, and I believe the patch set that we have actually implements it relatively relatively nicely. And so that's pretty clean. So anybody that has a PT reg struct, um, and we went ahead and added that extra space and cached the MSR in all the exception entry points, not just the ones we thought we would need, you know, so, and there is a little bit of extra space because we only needed 32 bits, but we went ahead and added 64. And so that allows a little bit of space there. And so anybody that has a PT reg struct can just get to that, that cached MSR. Um, so now to get back to the relax mode, this is another thing that, you know, our use cases really helped to drive what our core support needed. Um, like I said, initially, I really tried to implement something that did the fault handler and, and change the global, uh, value of all the MSRs if that KMAP call was called. Um, and, you know, 
like we said from the discussions, we said, hey, you know, if you update that globally, then effectively you're turning off per permissions. It, it's not a big deal. So we we kind of discussed having a relaxed mode. Um, initially, it was suggested that we have a relaxed, a silent, and a strict option, where silent was basically doing the same thing as relaxed, allowing the system to continue running, um, but not actually print any warnings. We decided to drop that because really the point is we want people to know that a stray write occurred. Um, in my case, a stray write recur occurred, and in Rick's case, that you know somebody actually tried to update the page tables without doing the correct access. Um, so we just have a relax and a strict mode. And in doing this, I was focused on people trying to do KMAP. So the KMAP actually tries to flag this relax mode right wider away, tell people where that KMAP occurred. And I decided to drop the 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 fault handling code because it was complicated and I wasn't going to try to do an update to the global. But the problem is with Rick's use case, there was really no way to do a relaxed mode without the fault handling code. And so he revisited that. And I'm going to let him talk to this next slide because he ended up implementing what is currently submitted upstream. Yeah. So I so, can just flip this. Slide. Yeah. OK, thanks. OK. Uh, yeah. So, um, so, you know, the, the problem is so the kernel there's a there's been a pks fault and how can the kernel know what to do if you only have one pks usage this is a little simpler um but now if you have two you have to know well uh, you know should, should we oops uh should the kernel disable protection what message should it print uh, in order to decide any of that it needs to know which key but the only pks information the fault handler gets is that the fault is is due to a protection key violation there's an error code bit page fault error code bit it doesn't find out which key caused it. Um, but the keys in the page tables and the kernel does have the address that caused the fault. So it has to walk the page tables to get the protection key. Um, that's the only way you can know which, um, well, I shouldn't say the only know anyway. That's the only way it's, that we looked at, it can know um, what what type of violation this is. Uh, you know, this is a um, this can be a bit tricky because the kernel could be an interrupt. So taking locks, it takes extra consideration. Um, and the special worry is that a kernel page table could be freed while the kernel is walking, and then it could start walking random memory. And you know, um, you know, talk about how um, you know for the PMEM usage, um, the threat model or not threat model, like the, the bug, the bug model is that uh, a stray access could happen from some other bug in the kernel, and we want to make sure it doesn't cause uh, problems. And so we, the the expectation for the soft mode is that it won't cause problems. And so we sort of need to handle, um, uh, you know, making sure we, we uh, you know, handle that well. Um, the special worry is that, you know, a, a kernel page shell could be freed, you know, while the kernel is walking and it could start walking random memory. But uh, luckily the kernel memory page tables and the kernel half of the address space are not freed very often, but it does happen. So, uh, you know, I looked at, um, you know, how we could maybe deal with this. Um, and this is an idea that we were tossing around uh, in the diagram here. It's pretty self-explanatory, um, but not quite clear how much we need to worry about this because there are other um, page table walks in the kernel that don't take this into consideration. Uh, so um, not sure whether, you know, since we're sort of worrying about the case that, uh, um, of uh, we're worrying about the case of like bugs. We're sort of our 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 our, our use cases that a bug exists. So um, how much we should maybe worry about extra things going wrong or not? Uh, right now we're not we're not doing anything special around this. We're just walking it like the other walks in the fault handler do. Um, but uh, you know, still sort of considering whether we should need to do this or not. Okay, back to you, Ira. Ira? Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and flip the page. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry about switching back and forth. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, no problem at all. Sorry, I didn't. I wasn't fast enough this time. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that's that's OK. We uh, we actually discussed a lot about, you know, how we're going to switch back and forth, try to make it more efficient. So 
so you know we you know we've kind of come back around to our status and next steps um you know obviously some of the the core software has changed with our use cases which you know i think is a really good thing um you know i think it's made the core more more robust um very quickly our our use cases are are posted um and the core was posted along with the initial pmem use case um version seven of the patches are now upstream if people are interested in how this feature works at least currently with the core um, it is documented under protection keys um, in the documentation part and and that was modified in that patch set to include the the users um, the i'm sorry not the user space the uh the kernel space protections and um uh, the page table support is currently in RFC v2, uh, and there's the link there for that for people who are interested. Um, another thing is that if you want to test this or play with it, um, it is supported in Quimu. Um, so, you know, this is the option to use for Quimu. And like I said, I did have a test. Uh, I did have a test slide, but I dropped it. Um, the core patch set does include a patch uh, that implements tests. And I have actually used it quite a bit to uh, do regression testing and to actually test some things out. Um, I'm sorry, but Paul's previous uh, talk just, you know, really kind of influenced me because writing those tests really did. I think I hit on maybe every point that he made about, you know, the test failing but not failing or showing success when it really wasn't working. And anyway, it's interesting. Um, and the next steps for the PMEM use case are to um, I would like to continue to remove the KMAP users. You know, generally the kernel community has said we don't like KMAP. Uh, at least the current implementation of KMAP, the KMAP local page is fine. And uh, so I want to continue to remove those. And eventually, once I remove those, I think we could, you know, and we and we see some runtime out in the wild, uh, you know, we can go ahead and make that uh, restricted or fault mode back to strict instead of relaxed. Um, so that we, you know, know that users are are actually fully protected. Um, and then for the next steps for P, for the um, page table, go ahead, Rick. I don't know if you want to talk this slide. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the um, this PKS tables usage is in a lot earlier of a stage than um, than the the PMEM usage. Still kind of exploring it out. Uh, so right now, what we've got is sort of it's functionally, you know, I should say it's not ready for upstream functionally, but it's you know we've checked all the functional to dos. Um, we protect all the known page tables, although that's just virtual page tables. It doesn't do EPT or IOMMU. Um, it, it handles the direct map uh, uh, issues with this solution I described earlier, and it has the uh, the soft or relaxed mode, as we're going to start calling it, so we can call things the same name. Um, so that uh, you know, if there's a, if you have a, if there's you know, we're, we're applying this new protection, this new rule on top of code that was written, not assuming it. So just take an extra bit care uh, care there. So the next the next plans uh, the plans going forward are around exploring performance and tuning. Um, the, the main thing I think we have to play with is how many page tables we convert at once. Um, so that'll reduce breakage and amortize the shoot downs better. And then also Mike Rappaport uh, had started, um, to actually took the, the first RFC and built a new, uh, a sort of a new exploration of how to handle um, permission pages on the direct map, which looked at putting in the page allocator. And um, so he's apparently gonna, um, continue working on this. And so uh, uh, this PKS tables usage would be a happy customer of that component um, if something can be, um, if we can end up with something and just a little plug tomorrow, there's a, a boss session on direct map permission stuff. So if you're interested in discussing it, um, please come by. Back to you, Ira. Yeah, I think it's pretty obvious from the chat session that your use case is the one that, you know, is still very much in discussion. Um, yeah, you know, just looking at, yeah, looking at the number of people talking, people are like, yeah, stray right, whatever, you know, go protect yeah. your PMEM. We don't care about you. <laughs> talk talk yeah. about the page tables. We care about those. Everybody cares about those. Um, you know, and, and I, and I, I, I agree with that. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, 
Um, yeah. No, no offense at all, Mike. I think this is I, I think this is part of what this discussion's for. It's one of the reasons that I really wanted Rick to kind of to to jump in with this conversation because I think it's um, you know yeah. I, I I think it's great that we're seeing more use cases for this core support. I think it's great that he fed um, you know he fed requirements back to me into the core. Um, you know, our last slide here is just acknowledgements, you know, people, you know, Dave is jumping in on the chat here, you know, Dan Williams with the PMEM and everything, the, the reviews that have happened, you know, obviously Andy and Thomas have had a lot of input, um, you know, Peter, Sean, Christoph, you know, and Fungwa actually implemented the initial core support in version one of the patch set that was submitted upstream. So, you know, all these people have had, um, um, you know, uh, input into this patch set and this feature and discussions. So, um, you know, I, you know, actually we really should have put Mike, um, on there too. You know, Mike has really had a lot of input with the straight, um, I'm sorry, with the, the page table side of things. So thank you, Mike, Mike Rappaport. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Mike? I, you can just chat. And if you got, and if you want, we've got five more minutes and I think we're the last talk of the day. So we could even just open it up to, to people speaking if they wanted. Yes, sure. If you, uh, so if someone wants to ask questions, please turn on the camera and uh, audio. We prefer if questions are asked uh, um, live, not just in the chat. Gives it more uh, the feel of a, an actual conference. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I didn't attend this last year. Um, this this year, everything, it, it's very nice. It's, it actually does have a pretty good feel of a real conference. So anyway, a, a shout like out to the, all the organizers. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of like the um, the sidebar chat. It could be a nice feature of an in-person conference even. Just people are on their laptops or something could be uh, have a little silent chat room. So I, I've been trying to, um, when, when uh, Rick was talking, I've been trying to read this and and discuss this. I, I think the and the initial question was, you know, could could this be done with regular page table permissions? And like I said earlier in the talk, you know, th this the PKS does layer on top of the per the, the page table permissions, and so technically, I think it is possible. I think Dave and I both answered that, but. You know, Dave, there's been a, a long discussion I haven't quite fully followed, but I think that the, the issue is that it's it's just harder to do with the page table permissions. Um, and, you know, I, I really I really think this is a cool feature where you can kind of set this domain and we can say all page tables are part of this domain that can be, you know, turned on and off, you know, just like I'm doing with persistent memory. Um, Dave, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I would love to see this, like the general idea of page table projection, I would love to see it implemented with more, you know, other pieces of hardware. Page tables are one of them. Like, it'd be also fun to do this with hypercalls. Um, we could ask the, ask the hypervisors to do this stuff for us. So that'd be there's, a cool thing to do too. So you can do that. Yep. yep. So there's a lot of options here. So if people have other ways of doing this, I'd love to hear it. Uh, the other thing is this hardware right now, I don't think we have any publicly available hardware that does PKS. So you probably get more um interest when that happens uh but we we really hope this shows up across a lot of cpus including all the way down to everybody's laptops so maybe in a couple of years people will be a little more interested when it's uh on everyone's laptops yeah i really wanted to say something about which cpus but the current software development model um, um i'm sorry the uh sdm says future cpus so yeah it, it is in qmu though if anyone i think we have a slide on that so if anyone wants to try yeah, this yeah. or if they have an idea for another um thing in the kernel they could use to quick toggle a little protection um this works pretty well so uh you can yeah. give it a try it's not you're not going to get the performance benefits but for development yeah i yeah i think i think what dave just said is really yeah so So Keys says, I want to protect against stray rights, but I want to protect all memory. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, yeah, I, you know, tech, technically, you know, from, from a, 
from a technical standpoint, that's really easy. All you got to do is change P key zero in the current implementation to be, you know, read only or whatever. Um, but <laughs> I think you would break a lot of places because the, the key is that you have to allow users access. So you still need to, I think you still need to create the different classes and uh, domains of memory. Um, <laughs> to be able to to allow access when it when it's um intended for um for 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 uh code patching <laughs> one thing i was sort of wondering about is if we could have um kernel page read only be a protection key so that we apply a protection key to um to the we basically instead of using the read only uh, the read write bit in the page table, we would use a protection key to apply the read only to text. And then you could just sort of patch it in place. Um, I'm not, I haven't fully thought that out, but uh, you know, someone mentioned in the chat about um, uh, text patching and it might be a, might be a small change. I did wonder though, how much people um, are uh, wishing text patching was faster. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. James wants a pony too. Yeah, I want a pony. Let's see here. We, uh, yeah, there is, there is still... Oh, sorry, oh. go on. No, um, Dave mentioned XPFO. That, that's something else we've investigated internally. I looked at that a while back. I, I forget the details on it, though. Um, but yeah, that seemed like it might be a good use case for this. Just generally, from what I remember. Yeah. But I don't I don't remember the details. It's been a it's been a while. I'm I'm focused. I'm really focused on getting this core support upstream, and then we can kind of you know, build on top of it. So. And technically, <laughs> I work on the persistent memory uh, uh, team here. So <laughs> technically, my my driving factor is really the persistent memory stuff. But um, I think like lots of people, you you end up running into memory management code and needing to update it and make sure it's correct. Um, only open the permissions. So Mark, uh, Mark Rutland, um, you said something about you only open the permissions on the CPU performing the text poke. I'm not sure what that was in reference to. I think the point there, Ira, was that when you're doing a text poke, there's really only one CPU that's writing to that piece of text that you're you're um, trying to modify. But um, that writable pasteable entry is visible to everybody in the kernel. And so in theory, a stray write from somebody else in the kernel could come and use that pasteable entry. So if you use PKS for that, in theory, you could do something where only the CPU doing the textbook had access to that, uh, that writable entry. Okay, um, okay, yeah. So this is what Rick was talking about earlier. Yeah, on x86, though, it uses the um, temporary MM to, to do a, a per CPU ma mapping. Right. That's, oh, that's, that's a good point. It's the yeah. textbook MM, isn't it? Yeah. But of course, that's, the, the that memory that's about to be copied is is visible everywhere. So you know, the attacker could just target the other memory that's about to be copied. Well, I shouldn't say just could just do it. It's, it gets more complicated. But um, so is that temporary MM CPU local? Like, yeah. That's okay. So that's been my confusion over whether or not we were actually using per CPU page tables is because we sort of have this half state where that exists yeah it um it maps it in not in the kernel address space is how it um how it works mm. i think it's i think not i think more than x86 uses it now i think i saw some other um some other architecture was was turning it on i thought power might be but um yeah yeah so two cpus don't end up with the same area that they can write to then uh, that's the design. Um, okay. I think a uh, NAT of uh, emit did that stuff. Yeah, and it kind of takes the user space approach because user space has an MM, and we actually have a whole MM just for textbooking. So it's a kernel only one. It's kind of like a NIT MM, but 
yeah, I totally forgot about that case. I hope I didn't mislead you too long there. Well, it's just, I mean, it's, it's not strictly a per CPU page table. Like I get that, but I mean, it, it is an interesting approach to being able to perform writes that are CPU only visible to that CPU. But, but in Rick's case, you want that to eventually get to everybody else. Whereas with the text poke, I think you want it to remain local, right? Well, the, the, the writing permission I want to keep local, the result of the write will eventually be visible to everybody. And so is that text poke MM visible eventually to everyone? No. Yes. The, 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 yeah, the write is visible. So it creates an alias, basically, but a per CPU alias. So we could, for instance, right. keep two copies of the page tables, one of which has a read-write copy of the page tables, like just like we have now, and then one other um, you know, top-level PGD that has read-write page tables. We could keep two of them in parallel, right? Um, this would get nasty for other reasons, but we could keep two of them. And then instead of doing a PKS write when we're trying to toggle permissions to the page tables, we could just do a CR3 write to switch between the two copies. That's an option too. Sure. Yeah, I'm, okay. Go ahead, Mike. You popped up a couple times. I wanted to comment to Dave's uh, remark about having a, the entire MEM for a single page table. I looked uh, at some point at having a proper kernel page tables without the MEM. And not sure it's worth uh, the churn uh, because uh, anyway, we will have to convert at some point and uh, it would be too intrusive, I think. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? We got to try it. It might be horrible, but it might not be too bad. I mean, if there are no more questions, then uh, we can surely close the session. If you want to continue discussing, I'm sure we can leave the room open for a few more minutes. But other than that, this was the last talk, talk in the referee track um, for today. It was uh, really great. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And good evening, good afternoon, good morning, I guess. <laughs>